One of the questions that I was asked when I started uh, asking people for feedback on this talk uh, is what I mean by practical. Um, because obviously there are a lot of FRP systems around. Uh, they all have different strengths and weaknesses. And so I wanted to spend some time describing exactly what I mean uh, when I say that Reflex is a practical FRP system. Um, and I don't mean that to be any kind of term of art. I'm not trying to define a new category of FRP systems. Um, but in order to be practical, in order to be useful for real world work, because my, my main uh, job has been and continues to be building real applications. Uh, I'm not an academic, although I, of course, appreciate their work, like everyone else here. Um, I'm, I'm basically a practitioner. And so what I really want in an FRP system is something that lets me build real applications, complex applications, uh, you know, the kinds of things that I can actually go out and sell to a client. And so I spent some time thinking about what the requirements are uh, for a system to be practical in that sense. And I think it really comes down to three things. Uh, they've got to be expressible, uh, sorry, expressive. Uh, they've got to be comprehensible. And they've got to be efficient. So expressiveness is being able to write the programs that I want to write. Uh, I need an FRP system that's powerful enough that I can do everything in it. You know, I don't want to be constantly breaking out of the FRP system to do things that aren't supported by it. Um, I also need to very easily be able to understand my code. And working in a team, I need other people to be able to understand my code. So it's really important to me that the code that I write with the FRP system and the FRP system itself are readily comprehensible to myself and anyone that I'm working with. Um, and then, of course, I want to build large applications. I want to build applications that are fast. Uh, you know, I, I need to deliver really high quality apps to my clients because they don't care what I'm building the app with. They just want it to be really good. And efficiency is incredibly important to that. So these are the things that an FRP system needs to have for me to be willing to adopt it in practice. The first element of expressiveness that comes to mind is having dynamic data flow. Um, dynamic data flow is one of the more difficult parts of implementing uh, an FRP system. But it's really important because in real applications, you don't have a fixed data flow. You are creating new widgets. You're destroying widgets. As you saw in one of my slides uh, earlier, you know, I was dynamically creating a new tweet widget whenever a new tweet came in. Um, and that kind of stuff is not unusual. That is the norm. That is what applications do 99% of the time. So this, to me, is something that is basically a must have. Um, so in Reflex DOM, and this is due to the properties of Reflex itself, um, creating, destroying, laying out, uh, aggregating data from multiple widgets uh, can be done entirely within the FRP semantics. It, you don't have to do anything fancy. You don't have to you know, go outside of it, use IO, use, use mutable state, or anything like that. It's all built into the FRP. The other thing that I've struggled with with FRP, and I think a lot of other people have as well, is how to characterize time. Uh, you know, I was really inspired by Connell Elliott's work for what I did uh, with Reflex. And you know the way he conceives of time is as a continuously varying value. And more importantly, a, a variable that has measure. Um, you can say one second has passed. And this lets him do all kinds of cool stuff, like integrate uh, a behavior over time. Um, and then there are other FRP systems that for practicality reasons or, or just because they prefer the aesthetic of it, they use a discrete concept of time. Uh, and some of them still have measure, which is an integer instead of a real, and some of them don't. 
but I don't really like betting on either of those horses. So the way that I approached it in reflex is that I took the least opinionated position I could on time. Um, as you'll see later, the semantics of reflex don't say anything about whether time is continuous or discrete, whether it has measure or not. Uh, all they say is that it must be ordered. So anytime I have two events uh, and they both fire, those occurrences are either going to be one before the other, one after the other, or simultaneous. And that's the entire concept of time in reflex. That's correct. There's no branching to the time. Um, so when we get into the comprehensibility portion, uh, one thing that's really important to me, and actually that ties in with the branching time concept, is that everything be fully deterministic. Um, in some FRP systems, they have a branching notion of time where you can take an event with a list inside and you can turn that list into a whole bunch of occurrences of an output event. Now, that alone is fine. Um, that can actually be made deterministic. But the problem occurs when you start merging those events back together. And what happens in that case is that it becomes completely unpredictable what order those sub-events are going to be merged in. And so, you know, you might end up with all of them from one event above, or, you know, first, and the other one second, or vice versa, or they might be interleaved in some pattern. And it's incredibly difficult to reason about, uh, even if it is technically deterministic, because it's a single-threaded program with no entropy coming in from outside. It's still not pragmatically, or practically speaking, deterministic, because I can't look at a piece of code and determine what it's going to do. Uh, and that's really what's important to me, more so than whether it's technically deterministic or not. Um, and so actually that is, is perfect for this point, which is that in Reflex, every operation that you perform has a well-defined output. Um, the semantics leave nothing to chance, and it's actually implementation independent as well. So someone could come along and, and re-implement my Reflex type class, and they would have a lot of latitude in, in how they implement it, but absolutely none in terms of what it does. Uh, they could write extensions to it that add compatible behavior, uh, but the underlying semantics are something that I want users to be able to completely rely upon. Uh, and that entails also being completely determined. So another thing that makes reflex uh, more comprehensible is that it makes really good use of idiomatic Haskell. So there are very good reasons for making FRP arrowized uh, or using a lot of monads. And I've actually written my own implementations of, FR of FRP using arrows and using monads and using all this stuff. Um, and it gave me a lot more uh, power as a language implementer. Uh, it certainly made my life a lot easier in those regards. But it's incredibly difficult for new users to get used to. Um, and, and even for someone who's practiced with it, you know, the proc do syntax is really, I mean, it's a good compromise. I, I have nothing uh, bad to say about the people who wrote it, but uh, it's a very difficult thing that they've uh, set out to do, and the result uh, shows it. So, you know, adding arrowization and, and stuff like that is a pretty big trade-off. Uh, and what I found eventually is that uh, you don't really need it uh, for, for everything. So uh, I was able to implement reflex uh, without using arrows uh, and with only limited use of monadic uh, functions. Uh, so out of the 10 things in reflex, uh, eight of them are completely pure. Now, as I said before, in the real world, we need efficient programs. They have to have good performance. And the biggest area where this comes in with FRP is that if I have, like, let's say I have a button, and well, like, like in the tweet box, we've got a button, we've got a text box, and we've got something that shows the latest tweet. 
if I put a thousand of those widgets on a screen, that can't make each one slower. And this is something that is pretty difficult to avoid in implementing FRP, uh, but I have avoided it with Reflex. And so that's a really important component because when you get bigger and bigger applications, even a log factor cost uh, on top of, uh, you know, based on the size of the overall program actually becomes pretty unbearable really fast. Uh, so in, in Reflex, uh, you only pay for the actual parts of the application that an event affects. If it comes out of a DOM element and then goes right into another one, you only pay that cost, and it's constant regardless of what program it's embedded in. It does. It, it definitely makes reasoning about performance a lot easier. Um, and and uh, you know, it's, it's honestly, I've, I've had more trouble reasoning about performance of like regular pure Haskell programs than, than anything that was added by the FRP system. Um, you know, laziness and things like that can be hard to reason about, but FRP doesn't really add a lot of difficulty on top of that. All right, and, and then for any application that's going to be open for more than a couple of minutes, your garbage collection had better work. And this is something that has occupied a huge amount of my time in implementing Reflex. This is probably the single hardest thing to get right. Um, but the net result is that Reflex is fully garbage collected. And not only are all of its internal data structures garbage collected, uh, it also interacts with the garbage collection system and lets you know when any of your external callbacks that you're using for your sort of FFI interface uh, can be disposed of uh, and gives you an opportunity to dispose of them. So, you know, in a web page, that means unsubscribing from, from any DOM events that you may have connected to. Uh, so all of that is handled automatically, and the FRP user doesn't need to worry about any, any of it. All right, so let's get into the actual semantics of Reflex. Uh, there are two fundamental types in Reflex. Um, this is essentially uh, the same as uh, the Connell Elliott conception of events and behaviors, modulo the fact that I am less particular about what your timeline looks like. Um, so events are things that occur periodically, and they have a value when and only when they occur. Behaviors are values uh, or are, are containers for values that can always be sampled. So you can look at a behavior whenever you want and it will always have a value inside. And both of these types represent an infinite timeline. Um, there is no concept of when a, an event or a behavior began and there's no concept of when they end. And what this essentially means in practice is that if you have an event or a behavior value, it is valid. You can't possess an invalid one. So we have a couple of trivial constructors. Never is just an event of any type that never fires. Uh, and constant is a behavior that never changes. Um, and as you can see, you know, since a behavior has to have a value, you supply that as an argument. And since an event that isn't firing doesn't have a value, you don't supply one there. Another thing I should add about events and behaviors is that uh, events are entirely push-driven and behaviors are entirely pull-driven. Um, so this is uh, a distinction between uh, my approach and Connell Elliott's approach um, and, and various other ones. Uh, but it actually ends up working out very similarly in the end. Uh, he has a type called reactive, uh, which is essentially equivalent to my type dynamic. Uh, dynamic takes the push and the pull functionality and puts them back together. All right, so we also have some mapping functions. And these are a little bit more complex uh, because these are actually fully general. So push represents all possible ways of mapping one event to one other event. And it's got a couple of things going on. So first of all, the function that you map over the event, obviously it's going to get the value of the firing event. 
That's its argument here, A. And then there's this push M thing. And this is to support those two monadic combinators that I mentioned before, uh, which you'll see coming up in just a minute. And basically push M gives you an opportunity to read the value of behaviors. In other words, sample them. Um, and you can read as many behaviors as you want. Um, and it also gives you an opportunity to create state. So uh, that's another combinator that's coming up. But that's what you can do inside of an event. And essentially, the point of that monad is to carry the current time. Because all these pure functions are operating on an infinite timeline and transforming the entire thing. So when we need to know at what point a particular computation is running, that's when we introduce a monad, and only then. So push m represents a computation that's running at a particular time, in this case, the time at which the event is firing. Pull is a little bit simpler, and perhaps surprisingly simple, um, in that this is a way that a behavior can be constructed from other behaviors. And pull m is a lot like push m, except that it's a little bit more restricted. You're not allowed to create state in pull m for reasons that I'll get into, but you are allowed to sample the value of as many behaviors as you want. And you can do all kinds of cool stuff like this. So if you have a behavior with a behavior inside of it, you can sample the outer behavior, and then you can use that result and sample that. Um, and so pull m also carries with it a notion of when we're running. Uh, but the interesting thing about behaviors is they can get pulled at any time, and their value is only allowed to change at certain times. So pull m actually has a slightly weaker notion of what the current time is than push m does. All right, actually, before I move on, are there any questions so far? All right. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, could you speak up? Yeah, th that's a really good question. And that's a design, uh, dis sorry? Good idea. Uh, the question was, why do I have pull M and behavior, since they seem to be equivalent? So they aren't quite equivalent. Um, because pull is actually going to cache the result of the, or yeah, pull is going to cache the result of the pull m monad. Now, this is something that I've discussed with a couple of other uh, people, and and I think this is a design uh, decision, and I, I would really like to get people's feedback on this, um, especially as they start using the system. What I'm going for here is that a behavior represents a value, and it makes it a little bit easier to reason about the performance of the system. Because if you were to pass a pull m value around and then use it in 100 places, then you'd be paying 100 times the cost for that. But if you use pull and then pass the behavior around, you're only going to pay once. So that caching behavior is very important. And what I was going for with this choice of, of two different types is trying to get users by default to have the right caching behavior in their applications. Um, so I think we'll see, as, as more people use it, whether this does successfully coax people into the, the right uh, attitude by default. Um, but you're absolutely right to point out that uh, semantically they are more or less equivalent. Oh, actually, there was another question, I think. That is exactly right. Uh, and actually, thanks for pointing that out. Um, so all of the reactive data structures are going to have uh, a T parameter. And what that does is identify the FRP timeline that you're a part of. Um, and part of that is also identifying what FRP implementation you're using. Um, and so basically, uh, within a given timeline, everything is completely synchronous. Uh, but over time, uh, you know, right now, that's the only mode of operation that Reflex supports. Uh, but one potential extension would be to allow you to write 
uh, communicating timelines that are not entirely synchronized. And that would be really great for writing distributed systems, because in a distributed system, the overhead associated with synchronizing between multiple nodes is pretty unbearable. Um, so in that case, if you were writing a distributed system, you might see some combinators that accept you know, events with different T parameters and combine them into an event where you know there's going to be some non-determinism uh, about how they're combined. Uh, and so that's that's something that I'm leaving in there for, for future expansion, and, and also as a phantom type parameter to keep everything safe. All right. So uh, merging and fanning. This is how you deal with lots of events. Um, the type signature for merge is a little bit hairy here, but but basically what it says is that you can take a container full of as many events as you want with whatever types of uh, argument as you want, and you can combine them all into a single event. And the resulting event is going to fire whenever one or more of the inputs fire simultaneously. And the output is going to be another dependently typed map with all of the firing values of those events. And the way merge works is really critical to that determinism point that I made before. Merge is always going to give you exactly the same result in any context, because the keys to this dependently typed map are supplied on the left. So if you have a key of 1 and a key of 2, obviously it needs a dependent type as well, but you have a key of 1 and 2, then if 1 fires, you're going to get a map with just 1 in it. If 2 fires, you're going to get a map with just 2. And if both of them fire simultaneously, you'll get a map with one and two in it, and this simultaneity guarantee is very strong. Um, so, th you know, th this this is a pretty important component of making the FRP system uh, actually uh, usable uh, for me. And then fan uh, is actually sort of the opposite of merge. Uh, that's how I think of it, and. It's actually the only combinator in here that exists only for performance purposes. Um, I guess you could say that pull is also basically just for performance purposes, but uh, it also introduces the, the pull monad. Um, but the point of fan is that if I, I, like, let's say I have an event and maybe it represents lots of potential different input events. And I want to have thousands of listeners to this event. And each one is only concerned with some subset of the potential firing events. Well, what FAN does is let me distribute that event efficiently to any number of listeners, paying only <coughs> log n uh, cost for that. So this is about as efficient as you're going to get in terms of delivering messages. Uh, because without FAN, what you would have to do is filter each listener separately. And then whenever an event fired, it would have to run through every single filter, evaluate the condition, and decide whether or not to throw away the event. Uh, and that's just not workable in a large system. Uh, so fan, and then select is just, this is basically just forcing you to, to curry this properly. Uh, because it's, you, know, you can see this is a pure function, so it's very important that it get partially applied. And then select, you know, when, this is another case where I'm trying to sort of coax people in the right direction performance wise. So event selector is a value you can carry around and you know that you can always cheaply select out of it uh, using the select function. All right, any questions on this slide? All right. So here's where we get into the dynamic data flow, uh, the higher order FRP combinators. Uh, they're both pretty simple. Um, switch just takes a behavior, so a value that we can sample, with an event inside. And it produces an event that's going to fire whenever the currently selected event in the behavior is firing. So if the behavior changes, you can think of it like you know putting a different hose in uh, a fixture. And whichever hose is currently connected is going to be the one feeding the output. So that's what switch does. And then there's this combinator coincidence, which is used a lot less frequently. 
Um, but what this does is it creates an output event that fires whenever this outer event is firing. Now this outer event is going to fire and its value is going to be another event. And so when that inner event is also firing at the same time, that's when this output is going to fire. So there aren't too many opportunities where this comes up, but when it does come up, you need it. So this is needed for completeness uh, and for rare occasions that, that crop up mostly in the library. Go ahead. Yes. Exactly. Right, right. And, and so if, if the events in question are sort of separate, you already have both of them, then you can use merge. But if one of them is going to be delivered by the other, then you have to use coincidence. Yep. Um, and so one important reason for this is that in reflex, behaviors... So, so the, the reflex timeline being ordered is organized into what I usually call frames. And a frame is a time at which every event in the system may either be occurring or not. And so the operation of the FRP is organized into a series of frames. Now, each frame is roughly broken down into two phases. First, there's the event propagation phase. And that's where we determine the value of every event in the system. And then there's a phase where we actually update the value of behaviors. So behaviors never change during a frame. They always change between frames. And that's why switch and coincidence are different combinators. Because the behavior is always going to have last frame's value. And so if you need an event, uh, if you need an uh, event to be switched in promptly, then it has to be carried by another event. And the nice thing is that it works out that you can take this behavior, and you can take this event, and you can combine them into a dynamic. And then there's a function called switch promptly dyne, which is going to do that prompt switching for you perfectly. All right, any questions? Okay, let's move on. All right, so now we get into the monadic functions. These are the ones that care about the current time at which they run. And there are only two of them, sample and hold. Sample reads the current value of a behavior. And sample can be run from the pull monad and from the push monad. Hold, on the other hand, is used to create a state object. So hold, just like hold dyne, which I introduced in my early Twitter slides, takes an initial value and an event. And it's going to produce a behavior whose value starts as the initial value and then gets updated whenever the event fires. And that's pretty much it. That's the only way to create state in Reflex. So before I move on to the final part of the talk, are there any questions about the semantics? All right, well, hopefully that means it's clear enough. So where do we go from here? So I'm using Reflex in production today, uh, and some of my clients are as well. Um, it is absolutely uh, solid enough for me to be comfortable giving a talk like this, uh, for me to be comfortable rolling it out on live websites. And so I would encourage you to try it out yourself. We are, however, making a lot of improvements to Reflex rapidly. And since this is the first public announcement of Reflex, uh, there will probably be a lot of feedback coming in in the near future. And what that means is that, realistically speaking, if we want to make this uh, as excellent of a library as we can, that's going to involve breaking changes. So if you do depend on Reflex, please use upper bounds according to the package version policy. Uh, I'm going to be sticking with it extremely closely. and Immediately now, I'm going to be putting in place uh, a deprecation policy. So, you know, anyone who does use it is not going to get burnt by uh, by the changes that are occurring. 
It's available on GitHub and Hackage. Uh, not all of the packages are on uh, Hackage yet. Uh, Reflex DOM uh, is only on GitHub right now, but you can grab both of them. And the way that I recommend to use this, because you know there are a lot of things in this ecosystem. Uh, building GHCJS can be pretty painful if you try to do it with Cabal. Uh, managing these dual GHC and GHCJS uh, ecosystems uh, especially if you want to talk between your client and server using the same version of the underlying libraries, it can be a real pain. Uh, so I would definitely recommend, uh, at least for getting started, use the try reflex library that I've made, uh, which uses the Nix package manager to manage all of that for you. It also contains pre-built binaries in a cache that I'm maintaining for all of the packages that you need to use reflex. So instead of having about three to six hours of build time, depending on your machine, uh, to build GHC 710, GHCJS, um, and all of the associated libraries, uh, you're going to have about a five minute download instead. So I, I would recommend that as the way to go forward uh, for now. All right, that's all I have. Uh, any questions? Great. Well, uh, Let's uh, get to the bar, I guess. Uh, we've got important stuff to do there. Oh, there we go. Uh, you can use the excellent JavaScript FFI that uh, Lauta constructed, uh, which actually uses uh, Gershom's uh, JMacro library. So you can write you know, arbitrarily complex JavaScript expressions instead of just JavaScript functions. So it's, it's great. You don't, have to, you don't have to have like some external JS file that you maintain. Uh, you can just say, you know, this is what I want to do in JavaScript and foreign import JavaScript unsafe this. Uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. And then uh, in Reflex DOM, we supply a way for a widget to run an IO action uh, if, it, if it needs to. So, yep. Anything else? Evan? Yeah, so uh, Reflex DOM is uh, a basically pure uh, Reflex library. It does use I.O. for things like building DOM elements, because you have to. That's the only way to build a DOM element. Um, but it doesn't have any sort of reactive logic or state that it keeps or anything like that apart from with Reflex. Uh, all of its control flow logic is done with Reflex. I wish I did. Um, the question was, do I have a formal semantics for this written up? Uh, that's something that I plan on working on uh, in the near future. I am definitely interested in uh, getting some help on that. I don't have a whole lot of training in that area myself, uh, but I intend to formalize this, uh, and I think it would be very helpful to you know, figuring out what optimizations are possible. Uh, you know, lot, I think there's actually a lot of practical ramifications of formalizing the semantics. All right, looks like that's it. Let's get going. <laughs>